There are so many great jobs within the cybersecurity field, not just the obvious ones like pen tester or SOC analyst. And a lot of people don't know about them. And more importantly, they don't know about the pros and the cons of each of those jobs. So this week, I'm going to be showing you five different entry level jobs in the cybersecurity field that I'm going to explain what they are. What is the best part about that job? What's the worst part about that job? And if any of them resonate with you, I'm going to give you resources that are absolutely free that you can take advantage of to get the skills needed to go ahead and be able to target yourself for those specific jobs. Coming up. Hey everybody, welcome to Simply Cyber, a YouTube channel designed for helping you take your cybersecurity career further faster. My name's Jerry Ozier, and every week I push out videos of cybersecurity education content for you all. So special thanks to our sponsor, Coastal Information Security Group. Really love the work they're doing. And be sure to stay tuned to the end for our One Cool Thing segment. But let's get into the content of today's show. So as I mentioned in the, in the teaser at the beginning, you know, there's tons and tons of different jobs within the cybersecurity field. And a lot of people don't know about them or they think that there's only like one or two options and that's what they have to do. And that's not true. So this week, I had given a, a talk just a couple weeks ago to the Women in Cybersecurity organization at the University of Windsor up in Canada. And great, great group of people, excellent questions. I had a fantastic time. It was about an hour long uh, presentation I gave, but one section of it was diving deep into five different roles. So I've, cu I've cut that out of the lecture and I'm packaging it here so you can just drill, drill right into that value. So the way the format's gonna work is I'm gonna tell you the job, I'm gonna tell you the best part about it, I'm gonna tell you the worst part about it. I've done most of these jobs, okay? And for the ones that I haven't done, I've worked with people closely who have done them. So this is informed opinion. This isn't speculation on what's so great about it and what sucks about it, okay? So just know that, and I hope um, you can find something that resonates with you and you can find your passion and you can get into cybersecurity because it is an awesome, awesome field. All right, so let's just jump right into the... Uh, to the talk, but there is so much in cyber and of course it pays well and there's tons of job opportunities and that's great. But like, if you can find passion in, in something specific, it'll be the best thing you ever did. So let's take a closer look at actually five specific ones. Now I've selected these five because they are, um, I wanna say there's a, there's a wealth of opportunity. Uh, these aren't super niche, super high, you know, 25 years of experience type jobs. These are, you know, tailored for the zero to three and really like three to seven years um, things. Uh, just as a heads up on the legend for the five different jobs I'm going to talk about, there'll be an infographic where the picture is that kind of ex explains it and everything. You can go back and uh, dig into that afterwards. There's a lot of content. On the right, I'm going to provide, uh, on the top right, I'm going to provide like one of the coolest things about that job. And on the bottom, I'm going to give you one of the worst things about that job because it doesn't matter what job you have. It could be the best job in the world. It, there's got to be something uh, downside about it, right? Not everything is awesome all the time. So I'm going to reveal that to you too. So the very first one that I want to get into is incident responder. Now, these uh, graphics with the extra detail comes from um, the NICERC, which is a uh, U.S. government-based org. Um, they resolve now to cyber.org if you put in that URL, but basically it's, it's a U.S. government uh, agency that helps develop curriculum for cybersecurity uh, programs. They do a lot of K through 12 stuff, uh, but th this content is fairly uh, spot on. The only thing I would argue is that the median salary is probably about 20% higher than what you will find in reality. Um, okay, so having said that, Incident responder, this is the person who is like sec ops. They're called blue team sometimes. This, this job is, there's a lot of this job. You either work at a managed systems, uh, a managed security um, system provider, solution provider, whatever you want to call it. And basically businesses uh, send their network traffic to those MSSPs and, you know, people are working the desks, manning it and, and watching it and stuff like that. And, you know, being alerted when there's intrusions and everything like that. Like a lot of Hollywood movies, you'll always see the person who's like, you know, like usually the good guys, they're like, oh no, like they got past our firewall, blah, blah, blah. Like those are the blue team people. That's what this does. Um, this is a really cool job. Like you will find a lot of uh, job opportunity and stuff like this. 
you get to solve kind of interesting puzzles and stuff like that. You could see the pro of this job, like that's a mountain biker doing an awesome jump. You will get some really wild, some really cool um, things because it's it, you're defending from active attacks. Like someone is attacking your organization, network, your people, whatever it is, and you are the front line. You're defending from live attack. So it's very, very cool. Um, the one downside that about this is bad guys don't work on uh, Monday to Friday, nine to five, and they don't take holidays off. Okay. So in 2014, if some of you recall Lazarus group or not, not Lazarus group, excuse me, lizard squad, who's kind of like, um, akin to anonymous. If you've heard of them, Laz uh, lizard squad, they actually denial of service attacked, uh, Microsoft's uh, network and PlayStation network. So if anyone in here, uh, got a, a cool video game like Call of Duty or something for Christmas that year. They couldn't play it online because Lizard Squad denial of service attack both of those networks. So the people at Microsoft and PlayStation or Sony who were working those desks had to leave and go to work that day on Christmas morning. And they didn't get off until um, 2 a.m. on the 26th. So being a defender is awesome, but you don't get to pick and choose when you're defending, right? It's like you work a normal job, but then there's a lot of burnout and stress because you have to deal with it when the problem happens, right? So just be aware of that. If, if what I just told you sounds exciting and this is for you, like you, you like the challenge of defending multiple doors and being that defender, I've included, and again, this is for afterwards, but I've included three good resources for you to check out. This first one is amazing. So this is, um, a YouTube video by Eric Capuano, who's the CTO of uh, Recon InfoSec, which is one of those MSSPs I mentioned. He's like a wicked seasoned uh, incident responder, blue team guy, but this is urgent IT update. He walks through, it's probably 45 minutes. He walks through an entire incident from, we, we've detected something weird all the way, you know, booting the bad guy out, doing the write up and all that like the full span of what that job would entail. So if you are remotely interested in and you have, you're willing to invest 45 minutes in your future, um, I would recommend checking that out because that will tell you exactly what this job really looks like at the keyboard. Um, and then I've included a couple other things. Elastic Stack is um, kind of a free, um, there's a, this thing called Elk Stack, which is kind of how a SIM tool ingests logs and how uh, blue teamers would look at them. Um, you can get some free training on that. And if you really want to go nuts, like this is 45 minutes. This one is a full semester long course from NYU that gives you, um, it's around cyber threat detection in real time. So you can, you can go real deep if you want. Uh, I'd recommend doing the 45 minute course first and see if it's a good fit. The next uh, job is cyber forensics expert. So now this is kind of part and parcel with the blue team of the cyber incident responder we just talked about, uh, except they typically, the incident responder puts the fire out. The forensics expert figures out who started the fire. And if the person who started the fire or the group who started the fire is still somewhere in the network holding a pack of matches waiting um, for you to go away so they can light another fire or if they're you know, quietly uh, leaving breadcrumbs or uh, persistence mechanisms, sometimes they're called to allow them back in afterwards. So the forensics expert actually figures out what it was. This is meticulous work. Um, it, long hours, uh, interesting puzzles. You got to understand technology quite a bit. Uh, that's why the Rubik's cubes here. Um, it's very involved. You get to go on to like, you know, bits and bytes into the disc and dead disc analysis and stuff like that. You can analyze malware in memory while it's actively running. If it's a bit more complicated, this is a really cool field. These are the people who get interviewed in court cases on, you know, what happened or, you know, tell me why or whatever. Like, this is what that is. Um, so this is kind of fun. Um, I, I put the negative here is the clock, like time, like you could spend, you know, a long time doing an analysis and maybe not find anything. Cause how do you prove a negative, right? You, you don't know if you've completely exhausted all possibilities and you just, or you just didn't actually uncover, um, something, right? So the, uh, that's what the, the clock is there. So if this is for you, you're big into the forensics and you like, you know, figuring out why. I've put a couple um, resources here. Uh, this is um, 
Nullbyte, which is, you know, kind of an online group that does some really, really great cybersecurity tutorials. But Kali Linux, which is oftentimes associated with pen testing, actually has a nice forensics meta package suite that you can install and do stuff with. So you, um, they actually have a nice write up here on how to get that package installed and how to play with some of the different things if you'd like to get into it. Again, I've got a formal course here on digital forensics if you want to go all in and really commit yourself. And then I have a NIST reference here on how to incorporate digital forensics into incident response. Uh, and NIST is like a think tank for the United States and they publish all sorts of great cybersecurity stuff. The third one is the cybersecurity engineer. Now this is kind of like a catch all one. Um, usually like the generic terms in the field are analyst or engineer. Uh, engineer is kind of hands-on, very tech related. They could be the person working the firewalls. They could be the person working the mobile device management or the CASB solution. Um, typically you will evolve from engineer, like engineer, you know, junior engineer, whatever, middle, senior, and then architect, because you have that, that um, background and awareness of, of like how the technology integrates and where the security weaknesses are and really how to understand um, how to build these masterpieces as I, I've put over here. Um, which is, you know, pretty cool. You can be involved with this, like some really cool projects, some really cool initiatives. You will work with um, this one. This role works heavily with other um, parts of the organization, and especially, especially like infrastructure. Like, so the people who are working the, um, the networking and the endpoints, like the, the, the managed workstations or the servers, you'll be working with them a lot because a lot of the solutions that the engineer builds uh, will be integrated with those devices. So you get to build some really cool stuff and work with some interesting people. The downside, this guy, um, he's trying to capture just frustration. So I want to say that's frustrating um, because you can say like patch your stuff, for example, patch your stuff or the firewall is locked down. You can't have access to it. But then either like the business speaks and sometimes the business doesn't care, right? So like patch your systems. Well, this system, uh, Jerry, can only go down for 15 minutes a month and we have to apply application patches that introduce new functionality that the customers want or that the product owner wants or whatever. And we just don't have time to do your patches. We'll do them next month. And then next month comes and goes. Like anytime you hear about these like data breaches because of patches, like uh, a couple months ago or last year, maybe uh, Equifax was hit with the Apache struts uh, vulnerability. They had a um, external facing system that had a gross unpatched Apache struts uh, vulnerability with Apache been out for a while. And it's, it looks like negligence, but in the reality, the cybersecurity team does not manage those endpoints. They don't manage the infrastructure. The infrastructure team does. So it can be very frustrating when you know what needs to be done and you're getting um, either stonewalled or you're just getting no response or crickets and no support from, from leadership. So be aware of that. Uh, if, if this sounds good for you, even though I feel like I just painted a horrible story, um, if this sounds good to you, um, you can use MITRE attack framework, which is MITRE is a, another think tank in the United States. And they actually put this MITRE attack framework, which basically fully encapsulates every possible way that, uh, threat actors can kind of, uh, affect your systems uh, from infection to persistence, exploitation and stuff like that. This is a great resource to kind of give you some exposure. Um, again, the idea is that you would grow into someone who's like architecting and engineering solutions. I've got a uh, Fortinet free, free access. All this stuff is free, by the way. I should have told you that. All the resources I recommend are free. Um, this is just specific training on a specific technology. Uh, and then I added AWS cloud security here. So they, AWS is obviously incentivized for you. Whoops. Whoops. They're obviously incentivized for you to understand how AWS works. So then you can go work somewhere and implement AWS, right? So they're, they're incentivized. So they give training away for free, which is great. I will point out there's AWS, Google cloud and Microsoft Azure. AWS owns about 64% of the overall global cloud market. So two thirds of the entire market is Amazon, AWS. So learning how to do security, if you're gonna pick one cloud platform, I'd pick AWS. And as a you know, anecdotal note, 
I, I see a lot of web applications that are built in AWS now. Like I do a lot of stuff at my day job as an information security architect at a large academic medical center, and I'm seeing AWS stuff all the time. So understanding how to secure that stuff is going to get you a job. Okay. So just be aware of that. That's a great one. Great recommendation. If you're not sure, of course you want, you got to want to be the engineer. All right. Cyber operator. Now this is code for pen tester, ethical hacker. The, the, the official title in the field is cyber operator uh, or just an operator. Um, these are the people who typically um, you're, you're breaking into stuff. You're doing recon. Um, this is like the sexiest job in the field because it's a lot of fun and you get to pretend to be a criminal basically. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's tons and tons of tools. People are doing all sorts of open source tools. People integrate. There's a huge community, um, that supports, you know, this red team type work, uh, this penetration testing type work. There's definitely a career path in this. As I mentioned before, web apps are, are like blowing up as kind of an area um, within industry and being able to pen test those, by the way, you can do it remotely because it's a web application, right? It's supposed to be accessible from the internet. Um, by pen testing those, you're, you're giving that assurance to uh, the vendors that their product or to the developers, software engineer, that that is their, um, uh, their product is secure, right? Because no one wants to be on the front page. The best thing about this job is you get to be the cool hacker person, right? Like it's awesome, right? It's cool. Uh, you know, the, the hoodie, whatever you want. Um, you get to do a lot of cool stuff. And when you pop a shell on someone's machine that you're not supposed to be in, it's very exhilarating because you basically have broken in, right? The downside, and any pen tester will tell you this, is whatever you do in this phase, whatever successes you have, whatever you find, you have to write it all down in a report. And a lot of people in this job don't like writing period. They like working, hacking on a keyboard and breaking stuff. They don't like writing reports. And that, I mean, so that's the downside, but if you don't have a problem writing reports, you're good to go. Um, so it's an acquired taste. I've been told, uh, this one median salary, a hundred grand, maybe in the Pacific Northwest, but th this job does get you paid. Um, and there's, you know, some certifications and stuff like that. So if, if this is what you're into, uh, I called out Metasploit training. So Metasploit is a framework that you can use. It's got a bunch of tools built into it. Um, it's mostly for exploitation, but um, it's a great, great tool. You should learn it. It comes built in with Kali typically. Uh, Hackersploit is a YouTube content creator and he's got a great series uh, covering it really, really well. I've watched it and I recommend it. Uh, again, free. Hack the Box is actually a site that has different VMs that you can like basically harness and hone your pen testing operator type skills. They, they have their um, machines at like different levels too and they're community rated. So like the community will say this is a hard machine or an easy machine or whatever. That way it's not just one person saying how difficult it is or is not. Uh, this is really cool. In fact, it's so cool that like you can't register on the site. You literally have to hack the registration portal to be able to get in a, a user account to log into the site. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of fun. Um, and it's just a great resource in general to start hacking away and understanding how to really do the job. Um, hacking 101, which is basically um, a six hours of training. Um, again, it's just training. And then this is, I wanted to call this out. This is coming up on October 14th, so you can still register for this. Uh, but it's a exploit development fundamentals course. So like um, exploiting is basically compromising a vulnerability to, to allow you to do something that you shouldn't be able to, whether it's elevate your privileges um, or break into a box, like get access to a system or, or turn something off, whatever. Um, these uh, people are doing a very um, introductory fundamentals course on how to write exploits. So if I've got some people in the crowd who are like, this sounds interesting from an operator perspective and you like uh, coding stuff, uh, check this out because they're going to teach you how to write exploits, which is sick. All right. And then I think this is my final one, vulnerability assess assessment, right? So vulnerabilities, these are, you know, apply your patches. There's great tools at the enterprise level where you can scan a free open source one is called open VAS, V-A-S, if you want to try one for free. Um, but this one is kind of like the engineer, except, uh, on the analyst side where you are, um, being aware of what the organizational risk posture is. You work with compliance and governance quite a bit. 
um, to kind of have this um, moving uh, value of what your current posture is. Because as new vulnerabilities are released, new te uh, technology uh, becomes vulnerable or, or exploits come out or uh, legacy end of life stuff. So if people are running Windows XP or Windows 7 went end of life in January, uh, for example. So like it's, it's a moving thing and it requires attention and a focused resource, if not multiple resources, depending on how large the organization is. Um, to manage that stuff and report metrics and do a whole bunch of other stuff. So this one, this one's great. I feel like this one's a, a fairly, uh, e not easy, but like this one's a good entry level one because uh, a lot of the tools are very mature within this uh, particular vertical. Uh, so you can, you can get spun up very quick and there's a lot of um, education out there. Um, I put the the pro of this one is that you get like a you know twenty five thousand foot view of the organization. You have a tool that scans everything, right? So you know exactly where everything is and what everything is. You know what's in the DMZ and what's not. You know what traffic's allowed to pass and what's not. So like you really have uh, you're sitting at the the control panel, right? And you can see everything. So it's very very cool uh, from that perspective. Um, the the downside is it's the same. Same frustrated guy, right? Again, patch your stuff. Okay, like crickets, like we're not going to patch it, like move along and then you got to like run it up the chain and all this stuff. So it can be frustrating to know that that, you know, Apache struts vulnerability is right there or Blue Keep comes out a couple uh, last year and uh, you don't, you have a RDP listening on the DMZ and it, it's just, you, you want it to be shut off and you can't convey enough. You can't scream loud enough into the void to get it fixed. So that can be frustrating, right? If this is something uh, that kind of interests you, I put Nessus here. Nessus is a, uh, a legit, uh, there's like three main players in the vulnerability scanning space. Nessus is one of them. You can go get free education from them. Uh, they also will allow you to download and use their tool. Uh, I think you get like 17 IP. So you could scan your home network and play with it and see how it works and stuff like that. And then by the way, put it on your resume that you know how to use that tool and that you've got experience using it. Uh, also a NIST document on patch management. And then US CERT actually provides, if you go to uscertsysa.gov, you can get like real time threat awareness stuff because understanding vulnerabilities is one thing, but like a vulnerability it, they're not all equal, right? So like a vulnerability that allows um, remote code execution with no authentication on, uh, you know, some, some in, like obvious external service is like the worst, right? So that means anyone in the world can touch this and you, you've got it out there so that it can be touched and they can walk right through the door without any knowledge of your infrastructure or any passwords or user accounts and stuff like that. That's the worst. That same vulnerability on a nearly air gap system that, uh, isn't really connected to anything, is a way lower risk, and it's not a big deal, right? So if you're staying kind of up to date on your threat awareness, you might know that, um, you know, this threat actor is, is starting to look for these type of services or these type of systems on the internet. So you can kind of um, constantly be updating whatever your calculus is for understanding what your, you know, risk is, basically. Okay, so I've, I've mentioned several different uh, you know, two or three resources per job that I've covered here. Uh, but I do manage this um, GitHub repo. It's a free, again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is for me to share only free content with people in our community because I don't want money or finance or opportunity to be a impediment for anyone to be successful. Okay, well, I hope that resonated with some of you. I hope you found the job that makes you passionate uh, for cybersecurity. And please take advantage of those free resources. Um, absolutely. So, but now it's time for our one cool thing. Okay, so this week's one cool thing is um, bringatrailer.com. Now, this has nothing to do with cybersecurity. This has nothing to do with technology. But bringatrailer.com, it's an auction site uh, for cars, but, you know, I'm not a big car hound or anything like that. But I, you know, when you grow up, uh, you have some, you know, uh, nostalgic cars from when you were young. And it's basically like an eBay for cars, but you can go and there's tons of different cars there. And I, I'm a big fan of uh, the Datsun 280Z series. And you can get one for like $3,000, which is not cheap. 
but it's not ridiculous, right? It's not like $75,000 or something like that. So it's a fun site to poke around on and uh, see what's going on there. So if you uh, want to take a trip down memory lane, maybe pull up the first car that you got when you got your license and you were all pumped about your, you know, 1987 Chevy Beretta or whatever, uh, you could take a look at that. So check out bringthetrailer.com. I have no affiliations with them. It's just a fun site that one of my friends sent me and I've been uh, kind of checking out and getting whimsically uh, nostalgic about. So that's going to do it for our episode this week. Um, thanks as always. And uh, be sure to leave a comment, maybe hit subscribe, uh, bell for notification. And until next week, stay secure. <laughs> <laughs>